All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Dooley Leadership Experience Breakfast Club. Um, this is 100% underwritten by Dooley & Co. President and CEO, Linda Dooley. Um, Dooley Leadership Experience, for people that knew, I see a lot of new faces, um, started in 2008, really focused on professional development for all. Um, today's Breakfast Club, it's going to be a ton of energy. If you didn't have your coffee this morning, you don't need it. Uh, we have two young professionals that are dominating in their industry um, that's going to take us through an hour of enjoyment. Um, just want to go down, go over some ground rules for today. So once we have our Q&A and you're called on, state your name, your title, your firm, and where you're joining us from. Once again, we do encourage everyone using the chat. It's a great way to ask questions. I'm going to be fielding questions from the chat. And it's a great way to make new connections with people. Our guest host for today, um, he was a guest host prior. Um, his name is John Cat. John Cat is the founder and CEO of Blendy. Um, I work out a lot. I didn't get me a Blendy yet, but if you work out, if you want an excellent blender, Blendy is the way to go. Also, John Cat is a Renaissance man. He's a financial advisor for Raymond James, the firm I work for. So it's really exciting to have him on to be a host uh, for today. Our, our guest speaker, a um, good friend of mine back from Syracuse University, we both played football together, is Lou Alexander. He's the founder and CEO of Big Ass Jogger, and also he's a national sales leader um, located out of California. I'm going to hand the mic over to John Cat. John Cat, once again, thank you for joining us. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. I appreciate that. That was a, that was a nice introduction of both Lou and I. Um, so I'm going to ask everybody to uh, test the chat out real quick and, and uh, just write your name first, last, and your company and if your location, if you, if you feel comfortable doing that. So first, last name and company, if you don't mind, into the chat. That way we know everybody. You can introduce yourself and uh, it goes along with the icebreaker challenge or uh, poll we have today as well. Yeah. So as everybody's doing that, uh, I want to introduce our guest, Lou, uh, a little more formal of an introduction for him. So a little bit of a background as well. After ending his professional football career with the New Orleans Saints, Lou set out as an entirely new field, knocking on doors. The former offensive lineman made a career pivot to selling high-tech products door-to-door. -door, and during one of Boston's most brutal winters, one which I actually know now very well, <laughs> the experience, he says, made him motivated, determined, gritty, and curious, a theme which we'll be covering today, and a potent combination that eventually propelled Lou to start his own company, Big Ass Jogger. So Big Ass Jogger is an apparel brand and social movement that sprouted when Lou incorporated jogging into his workout routine. Lou has coined his signature, chirp, chirp, <laughs> call, which is featured in his regular social media posts, that motivate 2,500 followers to get up and make the best out of their day with confidence. By day, he is a sales executive for Procurement IQ, a marketing intelligence company specializing in procurement research and manages a team of 14 sales professionals. Very impressive. That's my 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. job, he says, and he switches to his own company and he gives it uh, all, all he has from 9 or 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., which I know very, very well. And I know he could probably test this sometimes even 12 a.m. if we're feeling it and <laughs> we can do it. Um, so, Lou, I want to open up the floor to you um, with a chirp chirp and explain what that means and kind of go from there. And then we can talk about how Linda met you and how you're here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, John, thanks, man. I appreciate it, man. You make me sound really, really well on paper. So I appreciate that, man. I think I'm going to use course. whatever synopsis you have of me and market that from here on out, man. So I appreciate it. Um, yeah. But um, what I want everyone to do right now, if you can, is unmute yourself. I want to hear it. I'm, it's 4, it's 4.07, I think, for me right now, or 4.11. 
So I think um, if you guys are not up, um, obviously I'm up at 411. So what I love to do to get the energy going in movement, because um, I am a public speaker as well. So I want to hear everybody say with me, choo, choo. <laughs> come on, come on, give me some energy. There we go. There we go. Come on now. Get your cup of coffee going. I appreciate it. Good job. Good job. Now, John, I um, appreciate the introduction. And um, so this signature chirp chirp thing came from this social movement and my company named Big Ass Joggers. Um, and obviously, Big Ass Joggers is an apparel line and it's a social movement. And I'll get to the nuts and bolts of why Big Ass Joggers basically is what the name behind the name behind the movement and actually what that means as well. Um, but just to give you kind of a quick story as well and, and add a little color to knocking on door to doors and, and really get into understanding exactly the man behind the orange, I always like to say, right, is, um, you know, when I actually transitioned out of the NFL, as all of us and football players, we never know what to do with our lives. Um, and obviously, I think that's an issue. Um, I think we sometimes hit this point where we don't know what direction or we're just curious about what direction that we want to go. The only insight I had about business because I wasn't surrounded with it was the movie Trading Places. That was my only insight that I had about business coming out of it. So I always wanted to put on a suit and I thought that that was a cool thing to do in business and that's what I define business as. Um, not until 2014 or 2013, um, this is a true story. I had $22 to my name. I had $10 in a bank account and I had $12 in my pocket. And um, my wife now, and she, uh, she was my girlfriend at the time, she, uh, she gave me 50 bucks to literally pay my phone bill so I can take a flight out to Boston, but also I was waiting on calls from NFL teams. So uh, that $50 helped with getting me a flight and different things on that nature. But there was something pivotal that happened during that plane ride. Um, and on that plane ride, this is where it really transitioned my life. And it really helped me kind of understand the power of asking questions and the power of just being upfront and honest with people, right? And when I was on this plane ride, obviously sitting in coach because I didn't have any money to my name. <laughs> Luckily, there was an executive that was on his way to Boston for a business trip. And as my legs are crammed in this seat, because I'm 6'4", and I'm sitting in the middle seat, luckily the guy that was next to me was sitting in the aisle, and I saw him doing something on his computer that was very, very tech-focused. Didn't know exactly what he was doing, but it had piqued my interest. So I asked the guy, and I said, hey, um, I'm just curious, you know, what is it that you do? I seen him with a suit on. He was dressed to impress. I was definitely intrigued. Um, after that, he told me, hey, I'm the CEO of this company. Um, named Power Home Remodeling. And, um, you know, what we specialize in is, you know, uh, tech, roof, and windows. At the time, I'm like, cool, whatever. But it was really a technology thing that I really wanted to get into. So I said, you know what? Hey, I want to figure out exactly what you do. I don't know exactly. I want to look as good as you do because you're dressed to the nines. And I want to understand what exactly you do. And he gave me a business card and we striked up a conversation that was very extensive and leaving that plane ride, obviously at six hours or yeah, six hours from LA going to, to going to Boston. After leaving that plane ride, um, I left with a business card and also him offering me to come into the office and, and, and also give me a job. So that next day was, which was on a Monday because we flew out on Sunday. He gave me a job that next day. And that's where I started my career, knocking on doors. And I didn't know that I was knocking on doors in the in the beginning. And I'll tell you, being 6'4 and 350 pounds at the time, knocking on someone's door in Boston, you're not that receptive. So, and a lot of a lot of you guys that may be in Boston, you see me knocking at your door. It's like, okay, what is this guy doing here knocking at my door? But um, that really built a certain level of sales acumen and, and determination. And and with that being said, you know, it really helped propel my career into leadership. And um, as we go along through this breakfast club, I'm pretty sure I'll get to explain exactly, you know, my, um, my position in business now, but currently I'm a sales executive. I'm a director at 30 years old. Um, and I would never imagine being in 2014, knocking on doors to being a director of sales of 14 people and actually helping cultivate 
other people's career that is just as curious as I was six years ago or seven years ago. So, you know, I say this to say that my story is definitely, um, it's not the the the, the typical story. It's, 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 best, it's definitely um, different, and it differs from a lot of different uh, people that I know that grew up in business. But uh, it's my story, man, and I love it. And and I, and I hope you guys can get some inspiration and movement out of it because if if you can, it, it definitely can change your life for sure. Nice, cool. Yeah, it's a great story, Lou. I love it. Uh, and now I'm curious. Do you think and um, well, yeah. Do you think that your curiosity, that you, do you think you've always had it from birth or do you think you developed it over time? And what really made you, you know, reach out to that, to that man and, and ask him that question? How did, like, you know, yeah. like, what was the actual question? How did you phrase it? And, and why did you take that leap of faith? Because it is a seemingly, it's a big leap of faith, I guess, in a way. 100%, 100%. Yeah. Um, I grew up in the inner cities of Los Angeles, right? So when you're growing up in the inner city of Los Angeles, your lack of resources automatically innates and pushes you to have some type of curiosity um, because you want to be exposed to what's outside of what your bubble basically displays to you. And I think for me, I've been curious all of my life, but I didn't realize that curiosity was actually something that was a skill set. I just was asking questions because I was completely uh, either ignorant or just unaware of what exactly the situation was that was around me. So I think for me, you know, question asking was always something. I mean, my mom used to always tell me, hey, you know, you got to stay out of our business. Like, stop asking questions. Like, you got to stay out of our business. And I remember, you know, going back to her and saying, mom, I just want to know. Like, and I was always trying to seek education. And not until I became an adult and obviously playing football and all those different things, you have to be in a position where asking questions is a part of the game, right? So if I was on a football field and I missed the block, you know, I have to go back to the coach while he's screaming at me and ask, Why, what did I do wrong, right? But those things built you and they, they condition you to ask second level questions, third level questions, and really dive deep into exactly what you are asking. So that way, once you go on the field, you can execute. And I apply that same tactic to life now, right? So it started when I was a kid, going into when I was in football and now into business. And that kind of just all infiltrated and all trickled down into what I'm doing currently. And that's, I think it wasn't something that was innate. It's definitely something that you have to continuously build upon, but also your surroundings teach you how to ask questions as well. Totally, yes, exactly, I agree. And how do you think that curiosity led you from, you know, being the sales leader at Procurement IQ to then starting your own product line, Big Ass Jogger? Yeah, yeah. so this is interesting. <laughs> this is, this, and I laughed because um, I remember sitting at home March 27th, um, and obviously we've all went through this economic uncertainty and we've all went through this pandemic, right? That's why we're virtual. And um, I remember sitting at home really, I wouldn't say unhappy, but I was seeking something different. And I used to tell my wife all the time, you know, I want something that gives me that football feel. I need something that gives me that rush, like I'm running out on the field and there's 50,000 people screaming my name. I need that. I need that rush. And it's not necessarily the fans and the people, but it's more so the feeling of it. And so I told myself, you know, I run basically a business now. And being a director of sales, I'm in charge of budgeting. I'm in charge of headcount. I'm in charge of making sure that we're planning out quarters every single day. Like I'm in charge of people. So why, if I can do this at scale from people that are around me on a daily basis for somebody else's business and somebody else's dreams, why can't I make that into my own business? And I think the curiosity sparked when apparel line wasn't even part of the plan. You know, I wanted to create this as being something that was just more so a motivational movement and, and telling a story and, and, and doing all those different things. But it was not until, you know, uh, again, I, I always go back to my wife because she's the real reason and she's a lot of the reason why, you know, I've kind of been pushed in this direction because her motivation, her support has allowed that. But I remember telling her, hey, I think, you know, by telling people my story through losing you know, 110 pounds within a year, you know, I was 350 pounds. I said, I can create this movement named Big Ass Joggers that's just inspiring people to be their biggest selves at whatever they do. That's the name behind Big Ass Joggers. That's what it means. 
It means to push you at whatever you do. So you don't have to be a jogger, but being the biggest self at whatever you do, people can attach to that. And so that's where that curiosity sparked. And I said, my story again, I'm curious how my story can move people. And then also to, I'm an extremist. Let me, let's just not, let's just not, you know, uh, sit here. I'll be remiss, remiss not to speak that, but I'm an extremist when I do anything. So for me, if I'm doing something, I'm curious to how I can beat myself at the last task. And so my last task was being a director of sales. I've accomplished that. That's checked off the board. Now, how can I be a multi-million dollar business? Or how can I drive now to be this big inspirational leader and motivational speaker? And now I'm just challenging myself and I have curiosity along the way to ask questions as I go along. So it's really just that, that, uh, that innate self -comp competition that builds that curiosity and also wanting to seek knowledge about a space that I'm completely unaware of at the time. So I think that's what uh, really, really sparked the curiosity from that end. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. That's awesome. I love the story behind the name as well. And uh, your story even just of, of losing, well, you said 100 pounds or 110? 110 pounds, man. I was, 110 uh, pounds, I, yeah, in a year. Yeah, it's amazing. yeah, yeah I, was three, I was 345, 350 in um, 240 now. So. I, had a, I had a small stint in football just in high school, not Syracuse, not even close. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I was an O-lineman. I went from 195 to 160. 65 and i got into bodybuilding in like three four months so it was crazy so not not to the wow. level of you but but uh you know i understand a little bit uh hey, but the next question yeah i, I said your heart your heart is 350 so it's all that matters. that's right <laughs> yeah exactly that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> so okay so the art of asking questions one which i'm fairly familiar with being in sales as well it's obviously yep. very prevalent and uh, what practical advice could you give someone without sales experience to help them incorporate asking questions and curiosity into their everyday lives? Yeah, no, 100%. Um, you know, what I always like to start with is understanding exactly the mission behind what questions are actually, what the intent behind questions are. Um, you know, I, I always give this term about asking blank questions. And what, the, what are blank questions? Um, blank questions are questions with no substance that are going to be either yes or no, or they're miscellaneous, right? So, you know, I think there's a lot of people in, 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 in life that come into your life. They ask you a question just to try to break the ice and, and, and get to know you and be familiar about you, right? How are you doing? Um, you know, how was your day? Those are great questions. Those are greeting, right? But I think, you know, if you put in back of your mind and you have an intent beyond what your question is trying to achieve, then I think your question now becomes different. It's value-based, right? And so if I know I have something that I am trying to gain, I wanna let that person know, not necessarily saying it's selfish or you are trying to basically say, I'm using you for something, but it's okay to submit and ask the question and seek that knowledge because questions, they bring solutions, right? And if we're looking for a solution, you know, it is the prerequisite for a solution. And that's what questions are in itself. So my practical advice, what I always used to tell people in questions, if you're at a networking event, and if I see someone at a networking event that is the same, you know, whatever the case may be, he may, I, I may find a hot button. That's what I like to call as well, hot button. The guy has on not nice shoes or the guys have on nice clothes or whatever the case may be, or the girl has, you know, nice, whatever the case is, I think you always have to find how you guys have some type of commonality first before you can ask that question. So what is your entry point, right? So that's what I also go into as well is what is my entry point? And my entry point is always to be myself, be charismatic, but then I've now built that rapport enough to say, hey, well, what brings you here? And what brings you here is not a yes or no question. What brings you here is open-ended. So. It can be so many different things. Well, hey, you know what? I'm looking for a job now in the tech space and I'm trying to get to know people that are in my surroundings and that's why I'm here. Okay, perfect. Now we ask that second level question of, oh, wow, you're in a tech space. How long have you been in the tech space? 
perfect. Now you get to, again, deep dive, and it's about turning and turning and turning. It's like a drill, right? I think when we're trying to drill a hole into a ground, I use this analogy all the time, we don't just drill once and then stop and then all of a sudden we plant something there. We actually try to go as deep as we possibly can to understand if we're hitting a pipe if we're hitting anything at the bottom of it so we can be mindful of what's at the bottom in that foundation. And that's the same thing we're questioning. You have to make sure that you're digging and you're digging and you're digging and you're drilling because that's going to only push you to get more and more information that can ultimately be the one question that changed your life in my regard. I love that. Yeah, and, and if I can just add just a small thing um, because I found it was prevalent, at least in college, and it could be probably uh, prevalent in the office is that how you ask a question in terms of your tone is very you know decisive absolutely. as well yeah absolutely and, it, it, and in college we'd always be like oh hey what's up man hey what's up but if you say hey how are you doing you know what i mean if you have more of a tonality to it it makes it makes it more i don't know impactful so i love that and i love what you just said and right. the next question would become when you're asking these questions, how do you differentiate from being, you know, differentiate from being too nosy to asking too specific of a question, right? <laughs> to just being generally curious because maybe you could hit a nerve and it's not a good one to hit, right? So how do you how do you kind of pull back just a little bit and and differentiate between the, the two? Well, so I, <laughs> that's a good question. It's a real good question. So uh, I would say proceed with caution. And don't ask anybody their social security number or blood type. Yeah. So I'll make sure of that, right? That's where you're being a little bit nosy there, right? How much do you have in your 401k? Okay, cool. I right, can manage exactly. that. So, <laughs> yeah. so don't, don't, I, I, I do not listen, please. If anybody else don't tell you, I'll tell you this. Don't ask anyone what's in their bank account. Don't ask any of those things. That is not what I want to teach. But I think what you do to differentiate that is understand exactly the value. I go back to value all the time. And I'm a value-based person. And our conversations, as much as we don't like to notice, as much as we don't want to recognize it, as much as we try not to notice it, every, every part of our being is about bringing value any way, shape, or form. The reason why we are friends, the reason why we are connected is because everyone has value within this group, right? And that value stems through in ranges of everything. And so when you're asking questions, how valuable is that question you're asking? Is it, again, is it a blank question and you're asking it with the intent of just agenda focus? Because people see when you have an agenda that's only for yourself. And I think I like to step outside and say, okay, this is not the agenda. If I'm asking a question, I'm going to follow up with whatever value that I know I can bring because I'm asking a question. And in the case, and I always go back to this, this scenario and this, um, and this yeah, scenario on the plane is because I knew the value of my question wasn't nosy. The value of my question was to seek knowledge in exchange of me working for somebody or doing a service for someone, right? So you have to make sure that you're allowing yourself to have that exchange because you're offering that question and that question could be open-ended. And if that person says, okay, well, perfect. If it's in a job situation, and he said, well, perfect. Well, you know what? Hey, come work for me. Are you actually ready to do that? Are you ready to exchange mm. something? Are you ready to provide value? Yeah. So you have to push yourself in position to add value. And I think yes or no questions are nosy. That, that's yeah. just my number. That's why I always stay away from. I use this, um, this analogy um, and this acronym is called STOP. And I always say this into when I'm, when I'm in sales and I tell this to my sales team when they're asking questions to client. And it means stop, take out your pen. S-T-O-P, stop, take out your pen. And what I use is I use a pen and I put it over my mouth. And that tells me to shut up, right? And that mm. tells me to listen. So ask, if I ask a question and I want somebody to follow up, I always say it out loud. I will literally be in a meeting and I'll say S-T-O-P. And I'll go like, and literally go like this. And I've seen business people look at me and say, what just happened? And I said, I want to listen to you so I can exactly understand how to respond and understand exactly what question I need to ask next to diagnose the situation. So I think if we all use STOP in our life, I think we'll be better off. We will be better listeners to ask better questions. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, actually. Um, all right. So cool. We, we have a question from uh, from Kirsten. I don't know if you want to unmute, unmute yourself, Kirsten. Uh, you can choose to do so or I can choose to read it out for you. Thanks, John. Uh, like, and thank you, Lou. This is a fascinating um, topic. 
my question is um, when you were talking about setting goals, um, professional and personal with your weight loss, uh, how do you determine and when do you determine your next goal to achieve? Is it based on circumstances, opportunity? Yes, yeah, so I think um, your goals have to be compartmentalized. And this is what I mean by that, you know, especially if it is weight loss goals. You know, um, we, we, we sometimes want to achieve or eat the elephant, so to speak, all in one bite. And we don't compartmentalize what goals or what specifics goes into what goal. So for weight loss, for instance, right, my first goal that I compartmentalized was just feeling better, just getting my eating habits right, right? That was the first goal. How can I change my lifestyle to actually get my eating habits to be right? That was a compartment in itself because that's not exercise. That's not activity. That's not all that. That's just me actually trying to be disciplined. So we have to put that in a compartment. That's completely different than, what, than, than, than running and working out. The next compartment is what exercises and what am I going to do from an activity standpoint that allows me now to hit the goal of my weight loss goal, right? And then also too, we have to make sure that at the end of it, what is that actual goal we're sitting for? Because are we striving for? Because I hear a lot of people that say, I wanna lose weight, I wanna lose weight. Perfect. Well, tell me how are you gonna get there? So I think before we can actually go to each and every goal, we have to compartmentalize and achieve the goals in our compartments. So eating right was one. Then the next one was exercise. And, and within that exercise, it, for me, it was running two miles a day. That's literally what I wanted to get myself to. And I say this all the time, but my social movement is two miles a day is what I actually want to run in order to get to my weight loss goal. That's one compartment. Now, outside of that, now I can scale up and say 10 pounds is the goal first. Perfect. Once I lose 10 pounds, now let's go to 20 pounds. Let's go to 30 pounds. And then it just starts to become a trickle effect. But as you continue to achieve, each compartment, you start to set new goals within those compartments. So it allows you now to basically expand upon each goal in each compartment. So I'm eating healthy, but can I eat healthier? I'm running two miles, but can I run four miles? I lost 10 pounds, but can I actually lose 20? So I think that's how you can start to really set aside and really hit those goals um, and just set benchmarks for yourself throughout the time of losing that weight. Nice. When are you ever satisfied? Question. I think you're muted. Lou, what, when are you ever satisfied with your goals? Are you ever? Or do you just keep going to the next, the next, the next? All good. What'd you say? Hmm. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah, yeah. John, can you say something? Because I can barely hear you. Yes, can you hear me now? Can you hear what I'm saying or no? Hmm. You can hear us. Um, there's a gear at the sound. top. Yeah, so there's a gear at the top right of your screen, right next to the chat function. You want to click on that, and then underneath, you're going to see computer and phone. Click on phone and dial in off your cell phone. You should be able to hear us after that. There we go. Perfect. Sorry about that. Woo. Nice. Woo. We always get through something in these, don't we? Nice recovery. Cool. Very cool. nice. <laughs> there we go. There we go. There we go. It's all these cool. tech. This is this is the virtual. This is a virtual space we live in. Thanks, Brad. Yeah. All right. So, does anyone um, else have any questions from the audience so far? I see one from Beverly in that chat box. Okay, Beverly. Do you want to unmute yourself and and ask and just introduce who you are real quick as well? Or maybe you're too shy. I can ask it for you. <laughs> okay, well, uh, okay, so stepping outside your comfort zone isn't easy for everyone. 
Uh, are you, is there any tips you have for people who are very shy or introverted? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is funny. So my, my wife called me, she calls me an introvert extrovert. Um, Mm -hmm. because I do love my time and I love being to myself. I do. Um, yes, I am energetic and I love passing on and, and probably through the screen, you're probably like, yeah, dude, okay, whatever. You seem too energetic and too outspoken to be able to say that you're an introvert. But, um, I think stepping outside of your comfort zone comes with literally just a simple aspect of, are you comfortable with your abilities of of whatever that is? And I think, and I say that to say, each of us have a certain gift or a certain thing that we can give to the world. And I think Mm -hmm. it's just like practicing. It's just like practicing anything, right? In order for us to identify and understand what our gift is, we have to practice it. Um, When I was playing football, I didn't start off basically being a good football player. Um, I was overweight. I can barely run, you know, two laps on a track. And I started to practice and practice and practice and condition that. I think that's even with uncomfortable situations. Sometimes you have to acknowledge the fact that Yes, I am uncomfortable and as, as you will, but I have to put myself out there in uncomfortable situations. You have to just be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, sure. And I think when you put yourself out in those situations and start to practice that, it's something that can start to build kind of that callus and that repetition where now it's easier for you to make those adjustments uh, while you're trying to become comfortable. Um, because becoming comfortable is subjective, right? And what does that mean? You know, is it something that you want to be comfortable in your job where you want to be outspoken and you want to be able to share new ideas and insights? Or are you trying to be comfortable in a social setting where you go out and someone comes and talk to you and you can be the life of a party, you can dance with everybody, you can do all those things. So it's defining what you want to be comfortable at. And I think for me specifically, I had to take a step back and say, what is it that I want to be comfortable at? And I wanted to be comfortable with speaking. Speaking was never a thing that I've always was comfortable with. Yes, I was able to speak well and articulate my words, but I had to make sure that it was something that I, it was, it was innate. And as I continue to do these things and I continue to talk to groups and I continue to talk to my team, you know, now I am comfortable with that area. But if we go into other areas of my life, there's other areas of my life that I am completely uncomfortable with. And I think it's just me putting myself out there and being okay with putting yourself out there because that's also tied into curiosity as well. Let me put myself out there and now let me actually see what the result happens or what the result actually yields me once I put myself out there. For sure. Yeah, no, I think putting yourself out there a lot of time is is probably the biggest battle that people face and actually, I do have a question for the group, and yeah. I would encourage anyone to raise their hand and, and take their stuff off mute. But what, what do you think holds you back from asking questions to people? You know, it could be even at the bar, right, when we do get back to that. Uh, it could be at a networking event, could be just in public, right? What, or what, ha- what holds you back? And uh, is it shyness? You know, like what's going on? That's a good, and that's a good question. Okay, well, <laughs> I know uh, me, I'll answer. I'll, I'll answer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go for it. Yeah. I know for me, it's a lot of the perception of coming off as unintelligent or dumb with a question. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of internal fear of being judged by the other person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, yeah. So that was mine. It's like, how do you ask the right question to like sound like you have well one genuine interest um, and two like not sound dumb in the topic. I, I do sometimes preface it going like, you know, I have no, no idea about this. Can you explain some more? You know, it's totally new for me, but it's just having that, you know, first hurdle. How, you know, how do you jump over that? That kind of holds me back sometimes. I yeah. think a lot of people get intimidated by authority. Um, yes. And I actually see yes. this a lot in our in our work in the workplace where you'll have a lower level employee very reluctant to speak up to a senior level and saying, well, why would they want to hear from me? I mean, look where they are. Authority is a summer. Yes. Yes. And if I can expand, if I can expand upon that, 
you know, that is a bigger, that is a big challenge of mine right now for the guys that I've managed, right? And just to go back and say, how do you put yourself out there because you don't want to ask a dumb question? And I say this all the time to my staff is that, you know, I want to cultivate curiosity. And if dumb questions are a part of curiosity, I'm okay with dumb questions, right? And I think it also, you have to, you know, be understanding and willing that you're not the only one that's thinking about that question either. And I think sometimes too, like you said, the perception, right? You don't want the perception of, well, I'm asking a dumb question, but I bet you that there's probably 20 other people around you that don't know exactly what they want, that don't know what's going on either, but they're not asking a question. You just happen to be the brave one to raise your hand and say, hey, that's a question. I have a question about that. And it goes back to that authority. Like, there's a lot of things that I don't know as being a leader. There's a lot of things I don't know about being a director of sales. But I think in order for me to understand it, you know, you have to, you know, ask those questions and you have to figure out exactly, you know, how you are formatting going into asking those questions because there's no such thing as dumb questions. I know we heard that, um, you know, time and time again, there's no such thing as dumb questions. Um, but again, it goes back to that confidence piece as well. Like, you know, how confident are you within yourself? And that's an internal thing as well. And society has bla has based these, you know, principles and norms on us and, and, and these ex expectations that, you know, we can't ask questions that we are unaware. And everyone's not edu educated. I'm, we're not talking to Bill Gates every single day. And if we were, those guys will be Bill Gates. And so, or those girls will be Bill Gates. So we got to make sure that we kind of peel back the layer and create that human element to it as well, that they are human and they actually trip up on things. And if this question is a trip up, then that's perfectly fine. It's still a question that I need to ask because I'm just unaware of it. For sure. Yeah, I love that too. And, and Colin, I think Colin has a question for Lou. Yes. Hey, Lou. Yeah. Hey, Colin. How you doing? I'm all right, man. Thank you. Good, good. Thank you for this. So my name is Khaled. I uh, work for Merrill Lynch. I'm also a financial advisor and also a Syracuse grad 2011. So I've seen you in the field there. So it's great to um, great to see somebody familiar. Yeah, nice to meet you. Um, I, yeah, I want, you know, as somebody that, you know, you're enjoying sales. I know, John, you're familiar with this too, the markets as well, with like with rejection. You know, we all build our own tactics to get over rejection, you know, but I'm wondering what yours are and how, uh, you kind of, I mean, this is a point of question, how you in fo use football and your experience with football to get over that rejection, you know, as an athlete myself playing soccer, when you lost, you get over it quickly and can go over it. How do you handle rejection? How do you draw on your experience to get over rejection? Oh, um, you know, we can be here for 24 hours, man. That's a load. <laughs> I, I teach this. I, you know, it's funny because I teach this uh, all the time, um, especially objection handling um in sales in general this is what i would offer as just advice and i think also too we can identify if we do this um i always say are we putting ourselves in position to have objection prevention and this is what i mean by that when i'm telling a story to someone and i'm selling a product or a good or a service I am trying to map out what are the actual objections I will act per, I will perceive seeing or I will basically be aware of as I'm going through this sale or as I'm pitching a product or whatever the case may be. What are my what are my objections that I want to prevent? And I think it also comes from your planning, right? you have to be able to take what other objections you have from calls and you have to and other calls and other meetings and you have to start to see the similarities what are those similarities how are they all kind of playing a part because sometimes as sales professionals we get happy ears on everything that we hear so we want to hear a good thing but we never want to hear the bad because all we're trying to do is get to the sale but i always tell a lot of my guys get to the no quick as possible we have to identify the no quick as possible. Because once I get to the no, I understand exactly my positioning once I'm at the no, where I can pivot a, a bit and have something that is a value that is preventing that objection. But if I don't get to the no, then I'm never going to understand what my future objections are gonna be because we always are seeking the yes. So we have to eliminate the yes. 
the yes is our big, it's those rose colored glasses that we have on, right? That's our yes. We put our rose colored glasses on. Someone says, I'm ready to buy right now, or I am ready to bring on, you know, this, this partnership. And we're like, yeah, but we didn't ask any questions about, well, hey, what are your internal dynamics within that company? What is actually going to prevent me from actually bringing this on board? Have you guys actually adopted anything like this in the past, right? Now I'm getting in front of those objections and I can prepare for them and I can put my plan together and I can execute going forward and, and making sure that I can have those objection preventions ahead of me so I can make sure I get that sale or that partnership. For sure. And another big part too, uh, just to add on real quick, is that it's a numbers game, right? The more no's you get, the more exactly. objections you get, the better you are at handling them. And it's exactly just keep just keep moving on, keep trucking forward. You know, and that's the, the best way to go. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have we have a great question from Kirsten again. So Kirsten, do you want to take yourself off mute? Sure. Uh, Lou, I have a manager that is approach is to be ambiguous with assignments and want me to just run with it. How would you navigate that in order to deliver for your manager? Mm, that's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one because um, what I can say, and this is my perspective, you have to understand that your manager is task oriented. And this is what I mean by that. There's managers that are leaders. There's managers that are just one to make sure you have tasks and you do those tasks effectively. And then there's collaborative managers, right? So the ones that are task oriented, they're going to be ambiguous. They're going to be the ones that just say, hey, go out and do it. You can get the job done. Again, there's no substance behind that. So how can I get the job done if you're not trying to push me or explain to me exactly how to get the job done. So that's task focus. Task managers never, never last. And I'm sorry to, you know, badger your manager here. And I hope he's not listening in, but he's not a good manager. If he, if he's listening, if he's, if he's listening to that, I think the ones that are collaborative, those are the ones that are going to allow you and help cultivate and help challenge you throughout that task. So if I'm a manager and I say to my team, we have 425,000 to hit this year for our goal, go do it. That leaves nothing for their imagination. It's just a blank goal. They don't know exactly what they're trying to achieve. So I have to pick if I'm a leader that if I'm gonna say, I'm gonna show you how to do it first and then we can start to have, you know, proof points and value points throughout this time where we can achieve this? Or am I going to take a step back and say, okay, let's be collaborative and I want you to be solution oriented first, come to me and then we can create dialogue. So those are the different things that we have to also look at and, and take into account is that where is my, who is my manager? And also are they task oriented? Are they, you know, solution oriented? Are they collaborative or are they just someone that's just going to say, hey, I just have a job for you and you have to do it. And sometimes we fall into jobs that 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 have those type of managers. So I think we just identify it and, 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 and ask those questions and sometimes challenge his concepts as well. Challenge his concept because you can say, hey, I want to do this job, but you can ask him too. Well, teach me how. How do I actually do this? And managers love that. Managers and boss, they they love that. And, and, and the guys that don't, they're just not educated enough for the position and they need to be, they need to be removed. And I hate to be as, as, as cold as that, but they need to basically not be in that position. Um, so I think challenge, challenge your manager is okay because they would actually appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. I would, and I would like to jump, sorry, John. Yeah. I, I would like to yeah, yeah. jump in on that because I feel like I'm just looking at the chat in <laughs> here. And seeing people respond to the manager thing seems like a lot of people relate um, to experiencing a, a horrible manager in their career. And yeah, like yeah. you and I, I learned a lot from football. And there's yeah. a difference between a manager and a leader. Like exactly. Said, a leader is a person that will show you the way, but it's flexible to hear your input to make changes to find a solution. 100%. When, it's, when someone is that ambiguous, that's a hint that your manager doesn't know how to get the job done. And it's relying no. on you. 
<laughs> and to give credit to someone, um, Linda, um, going back four years ago, she always would show me the way, but she always encouraged me to challenge her and look for different ways to find a solution. And that's what I always look for in a manager. And I had bad experiences, but I've been blessed recently to get aligned with a firm that I do have a great manager that does the same. So I tell you all on here, if you're really invested in professional development, you can be at a great firm, but a manager can truly uh, hurt you in your development. So always be aware of that. If you have the ability to switch teams to get another team lead or manager, do so because the manager is a key part in your development. 100%. Yeah. 100%. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Courtney Clark had a great question. Courtney, I don't know if you want to take yourself off mute and introduce yourself. Good if morning, not, that's fine. It's cool. Happy hey, Friday. Hey, hey, Courtney, how you doing? I'm doing Courtney. great. I uh, actually know Lou personally, so um, right. it's great to talk to Lou this morning. Um, my question was, how do you get that sense of accomplishment when you were spending the day firefighting? Mm. Mm. That's an amazing question. That's an amazing <laughs> question. No, that's an amazing question. And, and, I, and I say that because I think all of us are in the world right now. And, and hi, hi, Courtney, by the way. It's good to see you as well. It's good to see you. <laughs> um, but I think in some regard, all of us, we spend our days, sometime, our weeks, firefighting. Um, but I think this comes with preparation, right? So I go back to understanding how am I preparing my week? Things come up randomly within our job. We never can predict those things that come up. But I also put my things that are of high importance at the top of the list and not letting the other things that are in the other task kind of cloud all the things that are top of importance that give me that, that, simple, that sense of accomplishment. I'll give you an example. So we had a quarter business review um, at my job. I had a huge presentation I had to prepare for. And throughout in the midst of that presentation, I were getting 25 phone calls from all my reps on a daily basis of telling me, hey, like, I need this, I need this, I need you to jump on this call. And it was me firefighting going back and forth, but I knew I had to nail this, this presentation for the board. This presentation was the most important thing that I had to do. So I prioritized the board presentation and I just muted all of my guys. And sometimes you have to take that same approach in, in life and in your job. You have to mute all the tedious tasks and you have to stay clear on exactly that, that one thing that's going to give you that sense of accomplishment. And you know what? You can also kind of wave in there. Well, hey, will these small things actually be a, a detriment to my job? And would it actually you know, be something where if I don't do these things, would it actually matter? And I think sometimes we think we need to be a jack of all trades in our job. And we don't, we don't have to. You know, and for me, and I'm talking from a director's standpoint, you know, I obviously I delegate things that I'm trying to that that's not that I'm not trying to to do from a from a standpoint of tedious. But in the regards of someone that is, you know, have a manager that they have to, you know, they have to listen to or they have to make sure that they're always being being uh, accurate with any information that they're given. I think it's just being able to really section out exactly are those tedious tasks are they allowing me and putting me in a position to grow my skill set or am i just firefighting because i want to be busy um and you just have to be able to say you know what let me mute those tedious tasks and let me give that sense of accomplishment on the task of the things that i actually want to achieve within my job or within my my business structure yeah for sure I, I think we can all probably relate to that too. I've, I've definitely found myself within my own business sometimes saying, yeah. all right, how do I stay busy? And sometimes the busy tasks are actually not always productive. They're not always going to get to the next sale to the next, sure. next milestone. Sure. And so focusing on that and understanding which ones are actually the ones that are going to get you and grow you are the, are the most important you need to focus on. So I love that. And I think That's just cool. adding on, you know, some, some communication, if you are that manager, 
with your team and you, you know, you say to them, Hey, look, everyone, I, I have to uh, take care of business here first and I'll get to you eventually. And, uh, you know, it kind of goes back to that, that manager, that good manager type. So uh, I'm going to switch it over to Marcus real quick. And um, perfect, a perfect timing, John. Uh, so it is 7.55 now, 7.56. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We did start a little bit later, but we just had a, a, a great show. Um, Lou, thank you for joining us at 4 a.m. Um, thank you. For your time. Thank you. Um, and Nicole, if you can drop the quick poll. Um, also, everyone, your feedback is important. Uh, we continue to create content that's value added, like Lou mentioned, and you're having a conversation with someone who always just brings value. Also, if you have suggestions for someone that you have in your life that you think is great to lead off a breakfast club or culture chat, please add it in there um, in the additional comments. Uh, I want to hand it over to Linda because we have a ton of upcoming events, and Linda deserves to speak, and she can share a little bit more about what's coming up. Thank can you. I, can I can I interject real quick? Yeah. Linda, do we do we want to end with the three takeaways from Lou? Because he had some Absolutely. great things to say. We, yeah. We will. Come, well, let me just do cool. a, a quick interlude about what's coming up, and then we'll break sure. it to the three takeaways. And 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 this will be a uh, future video cast that we'll have available on YouTube. So um, by all means, come and refresh your learnings because they were so good today. Um, we do really take feedback that leads to programming. And there are two really, uh, I, I'm, I'm so excited about everything we do, but the next two workshops we do are off the charts. Hearing a lot about anxiety, even learning about seasonal depression, people already getting into this dread mode, and we are doing a focus on wellness. And uh, next week on the 30th, we have a workshop on grounding yourself in your wellness with a wellness expert, Twenty Houghton. I think we still have a couple of seats open. Nicole will put in the registration link, encourage you to join in on that. And then one that we have just cemented for October. It, and I don't think that this is a topic I haven't seen. It's something that I've explored with our guest speaker, who is um, Andrea Line. Andrea is a, um, she's a PhD specializing in clinical psychology. And we are going to tackle inner bias. But from the topic of has a virtual, this virtual world we're living it in, how has this affected our inner bias? And it has, and it is, and we're not even aware. So that's going to be on October 28th. These are our two ownership workshops. We have a meeting this afternoon to develop our programming for the Breakfast Club and Culture Chat in October. And that's why I say, please give us your feedback. We will hone our topics and our speakers around what your needs are, because we are committed to two things in the DLE, and it's learning and networking. We want those outcomes through each one of your experiences with us. So thank you, everyone. I, I do want to pivot back to John with the three takeaways. Thank you, Lou, for getting up many times to plan for this session with us, not just today. Awesome. Um, awesome. Off the charts and uh, take it away. And Marcus, thanks again for keeping us in check in the start and the opening and keeping our flow. John, great job moderating the uh, oh, interview. Thank yeah, thank you, Linda. Appreciate it. All right, so Lou, give us your three takeaways, your three concrete practices that people can use to build their curiosity? Absolutely. Um, ask better questions, ask better questions, ask better questions. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I, I'm kidding. Um, I would say the three takeaways is first, it's okay to ask a question. I know it's, I know it's simple, but it's okay to ask a question. And what I mean by that is all questions are good if they have value. Right. So that is my first one. It's OK to ask a question, but all questions are good when they have value. That is one of the things that I live by on a daily basis. Number two is get comfortable with understanding your abilities. Um, I think the biggest thing is we all have an innate ability that we just haven't untapped. And I think once we continue to ask questions, that curiosity is sparked by us identifying what those abilities are. So I would leave that as number two. And then number three, curiosity 
it's only you seeking knowledge for understanding. That's the number three. If curiosity is only you seeking knowledge. That's all it is. All of us are trying to grow professionally and it's okay to ask questions, to seek knowledge. And we all want to be an expert in whatever field, whatever things we do. So I will leave those as my three takeaways and um, those should definitely be a foundation and a Kickstarter to start to ask questions. And um, please feel free, you know, I'll make sure to share my information here. Feel, please feel free. I teach, you know, these seminars and different things like that on the on on a weekly basis now with, uh, you know, sales acumen and positioning and objection handling and different things like that. So if there's anything that you guys ever wanted from an insight standpoint, please feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to field any questions. Nice. Thank you, Lou. That was great. Cool. Yeah.